Johnson. Today we're here to discuss Forest Fan. We're here to discuss uh, an occasion that I think the Forest Fan estate, especially Zoe Old, are probably pretty happy to have come about. And that is, as my mother used to say, I'll bet she's going to have an extra olive in her martini. Back in the days when you would have a martini with an olive. Um, yeah, the court cases, both court cases that have been being litigated against the Fenn estate, against Zoe Old, who is in charge of the Fenn estate, have been uh, dismissed. So we no longer have court cases with uh, Forrest Fenn going on, and therefore any chances we thought we had of learning anything via these court cases is now over. Uh, the only thing I'm going to discuss those court cases today, they shouldn't have really been going on to begin with. A lot of people have said that. But they were something that kept the Fenn estate and Zoe Old preoccupied, I'm sure. And finally, and I think everyone would agree with this, I mean, even if you were hoping, as I was, that something would be found out about the treasure, etc., through these court cases, and I was kind of hoping Barb Anderson would be able to discover something. It's just not going to happen. Um, so let's get down to it. Uh, let's just get down to it. Two different cases, very different cases. Brian Erskine, Brian Erskine. When I first found out when I first read Brian Erskine's, um, by the way, if anyone's looking at my eyes and going, man, Eric, what's up with you? It's uh, firewood season here in the complex where I live. And when I burn firewood or other people burn wood or their, uh, you know, their processed logs, it just uh, tears up my eyes a little. So I, I kind of learned to cut down on the, on the fires a little bit, but uh, even outside, it, you know, affected me, it can affect me. So... Back to what I was going to say. When I first heard about Brian, when I first read Brian Erskine's case, it was so effed up. I didn't understand what I was reading. I'm sincere. I mean, I read it, and I kind of thought, okay, there's got to be more to it than this. My legal friend, my legal friend, he said the same thing. He, you know, you you look at these cases, and you can, in Barb's case, they were pretty mis they were flimsy but in Brian's case it's it's misguided and just so nonsensical I mean it brings to mind the question I asked my friend I said why did this case why was this case even allowed to happen and he said well that would I said was it just the attorney wanted to make a buck off poor Brian because when you understand the case it's so ridiculous and he said well, that brings up the M word that attorneys kind of like to avoid. He's talking about malfeasance. That's a whole other issue that I'm not going to get near. Anyway, I don't know why this case got as far as it did. A lot of people made fun of it. A lot of people said it was a terrible case. It was allowed to go on and on and on. And then finally, Mr. Erskine, uh, it was dismissed with prejudice, meaning the court had something to say about the way the case was going to end, they could, which they can always do, but they can put restrictions and things on it when it's dismissed, or they cannot. In Brian Erskine's case, it was dismissed with prejudice by the judge. The judge obviously was not happy with this case. He was not happy that it was litigated so long. In Brian, in, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Barb Anderson's case, her, I hope I'm not repeating myself, I know I sometimes do, but in uh, Barb Anderson's case, it was uh, dismissed without prejudice. She voluntarily dismissed her own case, and, and the judge basically said, okay, we're done. We'll talk about that in a while. Brian Erskine. These are some of the things that people said about Brian Erskine online. It seems like people are bound and determined to F it up for everyone else. I would really like to see a judge throw both lawsuits out. Okay, they're talking about both lawsuits. Wow. Someone else says throw it out and hit them both for court costs and attorney fees. 
The paradox was stupid. Someone else said the paradox with stupid people is they're too stupid to know how stupid they are, compounding the problem, ultimately swirling into an asinine vortex of jackassery. I'll leave it at that. Here's someone that particularly was talking about Brian Erskine, which kind of came to the heart of it for me, because I only have the late, the last motions, right, the, the dismissals. But this is what someone said about Brian Erskine's case. The real purpose of this lawsuit is hidden at the end of his filing. He, Brian, asked the court to intervene and verify the treasures out there. He's basically asking the court to force Ben to prove to the court the treasure is actually physically out there. What this will do is obviously give him the location of the real treasure if he hires an investigator at the beginning of this lawsuit to follow Fenn around. Okay, that must do. He's talking about the beginning. Uh, he's talking about the beginning of the Brian Erskine lawsuit. Well, this is what Brian Erskine. I'm shaking my head. I'm not trying to. I mean, I'm not. I don't want to make fun of the guy, it, but it was just so misguided, and he's paying the price, literally, and it's just too bad. Again, why the attorney allowed this to happen? Why he just didn't say to Brian Erskine, Brian, it's a, it's a crazy idea. It's going to go nowhere, but that didn't happen, so we'll leave it at that. This is what Brian Erskine basically said. This was his motion. He said, I followed the clues in the poem. I read the books, the hints, all of that. And so therefore, when I did not find the treasure, it was a breach of contract between me and Forrest Fenn. You're probably saying like I did, where's, where's the rest of that? There is no rest of that. There's another component to this in that Brian, they argued over jurisdiction because Brian is from Arizona and Brian is actually from, he's a resident of Yavapai, Arizona. Forrest Fenn, of course, was working out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. We won't, we'll go there in a second, very briefly. But the, the, the gist of the case was, from Brian Erskine, as simple as it sounds, this was the entire case, pretty much. I followed the clues. I followed the poem. I read the books. Forrest Fenn said, if you follow the clues in the poem and you read the books, you can find the treasure. You will find the treasure, whatever. Brian Erskine's claim was that he and Forrest Fenn therefore had a contract, an implied contract. I say implied, I'm not, a I'm not a lawyer. I say implied, I'm not an attorney. I've talked about this concept that we, the Forrest Fenn community, have had an implied contract by following the poem, etc. And we still do not know to this day whether that poem and those hints actually led to a spot because we are not being told the location. That's a whole separate issue. It's an ongoing issue as far as I'm concerned. I've said the chase is over. The chase is over in that the hunt is over. The chase is over. I'm being a literalist. But all of the fallout from the Forest Fen chase is not over. For instance, Jack Stoop. I have a video coming up soon about what Jack Stoop has been up to, where he has been, why he has probably been there, what the status of the treasure might be, just kind of reading the tea leaves. This is something my legal friend has been speculating about and told me some about that I think is very interesting. Let's get back, though, to Brian Erskine. That's what we're doing today. We're talking about the fact that both cases against the Fenn estate have been dismissed and there are no longer any cases pending legally with the Fenn estate. So Brian Erskine learned about the uh, chest in 2016. He was in Cambodia. In 2018, he solved the poem. He, so he thought, Brian Erskine. Funnily enough, 
We know that Jack Stoof both learned about the chase and said he figured out the location, not the exact location, but the location um, also in 2018. So they both feel like they solved the poem. However, Brian Erskine acknowledged he never physically located or possessed the chest. Now get this, and this shows you what Forrest Fence had to put up with or had to put up with. Excuse me, a little bit of iced coffee. Brian alleges, I'm substituting the words plaintiff and defendant for Brian and Fenn. Brian alleges that he subsequently reached out to Fenn. And you can only imagine Fenn's, well, he, give, he pretty much tells you exactly what you, you might imagine. Brian alleges he subsequently reached out to Fenn after figuring out where the chest should be in order to inform Fenn that he, Brian, had solved the poem, but he had not located the chest. He alleged that Fenn was confused as to why he, Brian, had contacted him. Fenn asked, why are you doing this? <laughs> Brian does not allege that Fenn ever acknowledged that he, Brian, solved the poem or that he located the spot where the chest was hidden. Fenn subsequently verified that a different searcher found the chest in Wyoming. That would be Jack Stoof. That's it, folks. I mean, I know, you're like, where's the rest of it? There is no rest of it. Brian Erskine. Now, this other guy made this claim that he thought this was a way to force Fenn to have to divulge the location. Well, that never happened. Brian Erskine basically said, I did everything I was supposed to do following that poem, and so, therefore, I'm entitled to, what, the treasure? because I followed all the clues correctly, in spite of it being found by someone else. That's it, folks. That's it. Is that a crazy-ass case or what? I would say yes. I would say that case should never have seen the light of day. Like I said, my legal friend was discussing that. This was a very, very poor case. Flimsy is my word. Misguided. And like I said, when I asked my friend, well, why would an attorney do this? He kind of said, well, you know, I don't know. You know, can only speculate, but kind of, I don't know. That would be up to the attorney to explain, right? Then the other aspect of this case, which was battled back and forth and which ultimately proved to be also totally empty and devoid of any real principle that the court cared to entertain was that Brian Erskine, a resident of Arizona, was trying to make the case under the jurisdiction of an Arizona court. And Arizona kept saying, this is not our jurisdiction. And he kept saying, it is, first of all, because Forrest Fenn lived there in Phoenix. Remember back when Forrest Fenn was there with the Air Force? And he was out robbing graves. Remember that? And... Um, he was only there for four years. And then later on, more recently, he, uh, he attended a True West Award ceremony. I think it's a magazine where they gave Forrest Fenn an award. And so he was there for a few days. And Brian Erskine is trying to say, this is why there should be jurisdiction by Arizona where I live. And the truth of the matter is, that I learned from reading this, is that for jurisdiction to be claimed, there has to be some sort of compelling uh, association with the person and the state, city, etc., whatever level you're on, right? In other words, did Forrest Fenn have any ongoing relationship with uh, Arizona? No. He lived there briefly for a few years when he was um, younger and then he had only been there for a few days for an award. The court did not consider that enough to state that they had jurisdiction over this case. And they literally argued that. Brian Erskine argued that side of this case too about the jurisdiction and ultimately lost that. 
so what happened? What happened is that the Fenn estate kept fighting back after Forrest died, of course, and Zoe Old took over, and they just said, basically, I think they probably just, they kind of just said this, this case has no merit, which I think we all probably would agree. I mean, just because you, you followed the clues in your mind and you read the books in your mind uh, and you were correct in your mind um, does not give you title to the gold, so to speak. Um, especially when it's found in a different state and it's found uh, literally recovered by someone else in a different state. The treasure is now possessed by someone else. So what was the outcome of this for uh, Brian Erskine? The case was dismissed with prejudice. With prejudice. With prejudice means the case will, was dismissed with a loss of certain rights or privileges. And, and, and in this case, um, what happened, unfortunately, for Brian is that... Um, so what happened to uh, Brian? What happened to Brian is this. Attorney's fees. This is where it gets bad. This is what can happen to you if you bring a very misguided, flimsy, empty case forward and argue it, and the court gets irritated with the fact that the case has no merit, and it's wasting everybody's time, and of course, it's forcing the other side, in this case, Zoe Old in the Fenn estate, to defend themselves and spend money. So what did they do? What did the judge do with Brian Erskine? He said that the defendant, Forrest Fenn Estate, Zoe Old, request its attorney's fees and cost in defending this action. The court agrees that Fenn Estate is entitled to seek reasonable attorney's fees and cost and can submit an application for that. In other words, the court said to uh, both parties, Yes, the Fenn Estate can make Jack, or, or I'm sorry, yes, the Fenn Estate can make Brian Erskine pay for the attorney's fees of uh, the attorney fees of the Fenn Estate. My friend said it looks like those fees are going to be about $100,000. So Brian Erskine is having to pay the Fenn Estate fees of $100,000 and probably has incurred his own fees, my friend thought of probably minimum $25,000. Brian Erskine's case was dismissed with prejudice, and Brian Erskine is having to pay as a penalty, if you were, that's what I would consider it, minimum of $125,000. Good argument to not bring flimsy cases forward and try to argue them, because in the end, you could get burned pretty bad. I don't know Mr. Erskine's background, but I would say none of us can easily afford to just lose $125,000. That case is over. So, Brian Erskine, if he was smart, would just, you know, fade away and uh, stay away from the Fenn estate. That's what I would suggest. Part two coming up.